right, everybody, welcome back to the Living the Life show. I got a very, very special guest in the house. We got the one and only Rachel Koval. What's going on, Miss Koval? Hi, thank you so much for talking with me about my experience. Oh, my goodness. I'm, I'm so looking forward to this. The moment I heard you say that you had just completed reading the Bible in one year and you made it on the deadline, I was like, oh, I got to get her on the show. <laughs> got to get her on the show. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about that as well. But I always start off each podcast getting to know our guest a little bit because None of us know who this mystery woman is, right? So I want to call this segment Getting a Read on Rachel. Ooh, I just taught alliteration last Friday, so I'm feeling that title. <laughs> Getting a Read on Rachel. So I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions. You don't get to think long. You just got to answer them off the top of your head. Okay. All right. What's your favorite dessert? Ooh, key lime pie. Really? All right. Mm -hmm. Any specific brand or homemade? So, I mean, homemade is always incredible, but I mean, Marie Callender does it right too. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like pizza when it's bad, did, did it's still pretty that? good. Did you, <laughs> yeah. did you just do that part? Yeah. <laughs> Marie, Marie Callender. I mean, don't tell my mom. <laughs> uh, all right. What's your favorite? Now, because you are an avid reader, all right, mm -hmm. I actually give you this in two parts. Most people, they only get it one part when I ask this question. What's your favorite nonfiction book and your favorite fiction book that you've ever read? Okay, nonfiction is easy because I'm not an avid nonfiction reader, but I love Freakonomics and Super Freakonomics. Um, I re would recommend those two. It's written by an economist and an author together. Um, and so it has this narrative quality to it and it makes mathematics and economics accessible to anyone. Mm. And it also has some mind-blowing statistics. So I read it for the first time when I was, maybe high, maybe high school or early college. And even in the intro, they had this little part where they break down that you're more likely to die from an elephant attack than a shark attack in your lifetime and why. And you were hooked from <laughs> and that I moment just remember on. from that moment on, I didn't fear the sharks, but I'm terrified of, <laughs> of chunks. Ah, that is hilarious. There's an and elephant right my, behind you, by the way. I, <laughs> and then my fiction, fi that's, that's, That's cool to ask one. an English teacher what their favorite fiction tale is. Mm, the tough, one that though, got me it? hooked in high school was definitely The Giver. The Giver I remember. And it was even a passage in The Giver where Lowry describes an apple being tossed in the air and it changing form for a moment mm. to the boy. And later you realize that for the first time he saw color, mm. but because he didn't have the lexicon to describe color, um, he had to go about it a different way. But I remember thinking that is incredible that language yeah. was able to express someone seeing color for the first time. Absolutely. It's funny you say that because, you know, I've written three books, right? And never written a novel. My, I want to write a novel. I started writing a novel, but I don't read fiction. So I, I watch a lot of movies and I'm now I find myself watching dialogue in movies going, I love the way they did that. Yes. The, the craftiness of the words in a, it's, it's the show don't tell, but it's in yes. the movie. And it's like, wow, that was so cool. And it's giving me ideas of how to structure the dialogue when I get back. You to should writing. do a screenplay. I need to sit down and finish. What well, the book that I want to write, I, I think it'd be a great movie. It's just I need to I need to sit down and write. I'm just if you need any editors, you know, huh? I got you. If you need you, editors pro bono. You know I got you. <laughs> Y'all heard her say pro bono. Let me rec let me double, <laughs> yeah, right? Wait, I'm sorry. That. This is recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my manager is whispering three percent. I don't know. We'll talk. Right. So, what was your favorite book in the Bible as you were reading? Ooh, I love Ecclesiastes. You're my second guest of... that said that. Really? Yes, but the other guest that said that is actually a poet. So Ecclesiastes was his favorite, but he's a poet. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, maybe that, maybe my love of literacy is part of that. I mean, I'm actually surprised. I would think that a poet would pick Psalms, um, well, Lamentations. I, mean, I guess or... I guess Ecclesiastes has more of a deepness and a there's darkness to it. And you know, I don't know. I I felt like I mean, I've coined all my friends that I'm in Bible study with now, they know. Um, I describe everything as ecclesiastical now. <laughs> so they're like, oh, how was yeah, those, these French fries are ecclesiastical? <laughs> no, seriously, I'll be like that. I had an ecclesiastical old fashioned. <laughs> and I was like, God made the bitters and the orange rind. 
<laughs> that is hilarious. All right, so I got two Ecclesiasticals down. Now, which Bible character, which character in the Bible do you feel like you relate to the most? Ruth. Second time I've had Ruth. All right, tell me why Ruth. Um, I mean, it would it would be simple to say it's a strong female character, but that was the first book. Um, well, obviously that's the first book in the Old Testament, in the Bible in general, where the, the female character is the lead and the title character. Mm. And then the way that they described the cultural norm at the time, right, was that Ruth was supposed to be sent back to live with her people mm -hmm. after the death of her husband. But the mother-in-law knew and had compassion that she wasn't raised with those people. So she, you can't just return to a community that you that you weren't brought up in. So they together formed this like new family mm. after the loss that they both experienced and found a way to not only survive, but then thrive again. Mm. But it was only because they were both willing to trust in each other after um, their only blood tie was, well, there was no blood tie. That's the point, right? Yeah. They were willing to trust in each other, even though they didn't have a blood tie. Now, you, you remember what we just said like five minutes ago? You said, I hope this will be beneficial to someone, right? Yeah. Just, just, I'm just telling you, just your description of Ruth right now. If I had never read Ruth, I'd want to. You see what I'm oh, saying? Like that's you, good. you painted well, a picture. It's really short. So. <laughs> but but think about it. Most people are like, man, the Bible's so dry, it's so boring. I don't get it. You painted a picture of Ruth right now that came alive. I like I could oh. see it and I want to read it now. If I wasn't a Bible reader or a reader of Ruth. I've read all these other books, but I never read Ruth. I'd want to read it now. So you've already blessed at least one person listening. All right. I hope you reread it after this. I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, I, I've read Ruth several times, so I enjoy yeah. Ruth, but for a person that doesn't read, because believe it or not, there's books in the old Testament that I've probably only skimmed through. I've yeah. never read the Bible all the way through like you. And that's why I really wanted to get you on to get your insight, to get a little bit of, you know, your experience from it. Because I think it would be a blessing, number one, a blessing to me, but anybody who hears or listens to this, because I guarantee there's a lot of people that want to read like that, but they might feel like they need a little guidance on how to yeah. best attack it, you know? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Last yeah. question. I mean, I kept saying the whole time it was eating the elephant one bite at a time. I say mm. that to my students all the time. And I really do try to live my life that way. Yeah. Reading the Bible in a year sounds like a Herculean task and it is. But then when you think of it as I'm going to read one book a week, that's doable. That's except it, for Psalms. That's Ecclesi Psalms, that's <laughs> Psalms that's you got to start yesterday. And that's then Ecclesiastical. Maybe that was Ecclesiastes. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, it's going to catch on. I'm going to uh, make it happen. All right. Last question of uh, getting, the getting the read on Rachel. Uh, what's your favorite board game? Ooh, I was raised on Risk, the game of world domination. Of course. That sounds about like you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to just for just for a shout out to my mom and dad, I'm going to have to say Risk. Awesome. Shout out to mom and dad on risk. Now, yeah. speaking of mom and dad, did you grow up in a strong Bible reading home or like what made you want to to read the Bible in one year? So my pathway with religion has been really interesting. So I was raised Russian Orthodox. So my brothers, I have two older brothers, myself and my dad and his whole family are Russian Orthodox. Um, my mom is Catholic. And when we were born, my mom really wanted us to go to church. Mm. And, but somehow they agreed that the Orthodox church was a more like intimate and culturally intertwined environment than the class, than the Catholic church. So we started going to Greek Orthodox churches. Um, I think we might've even gone to Ukrainian Orthodox for a little bit. And then we settled in the DC area and we started going to the Carpatho Russian Orthodox church in Potomac, Maryland, whoo, shout out. Um, <laughs> they are, and they really were my religious family growing up. So you mm. have to imagine a very traditional environment. So we're talking only six pews on each side. I want to say the entire congregation was 50 to 70 people total, mm -hmm. but it made it so that you, you knew every family growing up. It yeah. wasn't, and it really was 
a community in that and that we all played a role in. So mm. I was lucky enough to be the leader of my youth group for um, at least one year during my high school years. Um, but it was also, it's such a small environment that everyone has some kind of role like that. Like, obviously I was honored to do that, but also they found a way to give every kid and adult a role. Mm. My dad was on the church board. Um, my mom, even though she was Catholic, she got involved with as much as she could there. I got to do youth group. It was very, it was very communal yeah. and it was just, but it was also very traditional. So I remember talking to my friends growing up and saying, oh, how long is your church and what do you wear? And they'd say, oh, it's like half an hour. Um, and, you know, I can kind of wear <laughs> jeans or sneakers. You're like half like, an hour. I was like, we had you're rolling up to yet. church <laughs> in denim? <laughs> like that, that blew my mind because yeah. ours was very, you dress very nicely. It's very like beautiful mm. in how traditional it is. They are clearly trying to mimic the way it was also done 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the incense, the cantations, it's a lot of it is in Slavonic prayer that I grew up saying. Um, so I didn't understand this more like new age laid back, um, church attitude until mm -hmm. honestly, until I came to Nashville. But so after my experience with my church, I, I graduated, went to college, and then I really didn't go to church regularly to practice my faith until Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what happened? And now in Nashville? I don't what? go to church. I don't go to church in Nashville. I watch Crosspoint with a lot of my friends, and I've talked to a lot of people about their churches. I feel kind of at a, I honestly feel at an intersection and something I think about where. I need to make a choice for myself now as an adult mm. woman, whether I want to continue on the traditional path, which has a beauty to it, mm -hmm. like a true beauty to the, I don't want to say monotony in a bad way, a beauty to the, the order the tradition and repetition of yeah. it. The ritual um, rituals. Yes. Ritual. The rich, exactly the ritual of it, but it, it doesn't lack message, but the message isn't as, readily adapted to who I am and where I am in my 31 year old single female life. Mm. Um, so do I want to go for message or do I want to go for ritual? And I honestly don't know mm. to like, well, to this uh, point, I, I just guarantee know that I'm, you, you know. your desire for God, God will direct you in the proper yeah. direction for that, you know, because those, I mean, those are legitimate questions. Like what, what do I really want out of this the main things if, if you're if you're entering church for a desire to worship and honor god you're going to get that no matter what it's like you're saying feeling the fulfillment of i want to be fed i want to be poured into and a lot of times especially when it comes to church we can become so ritualistic that we lose focus on relationship with god because you know i i interviewed one of my former students and he's uh getting ready to be a catholic priest and, um, you know, and I was telling him about, you know, one of the things that attracted him to the Catholic Church, because he's an African-American. You don't see too many African-Americans no. in the Catholic Church. And he loved the rituals. He loved, you know, the order and how things are done in service. And and I just posed the question to him that, you know, or posed the statement that we have to be careful that we don't get so into rituals that we lose sight of having a relationship with God. Because, you know, I can... Um, take communion every single day but mm -hmm. if my heart is not right all i did was mm -hmm. eat, a, eat a cracker or some bread and mm -hmm. some wine you know it doesn't equate to much you know so i get oh, absolutely if that if your desire is to chase after god i guarantee you he's going to direct your path into which what's best for you to continue to grow close to him you know because we can yeah. we can find a niche where we can fit into but it's too lax and it's not really challenging us to live up to God's standard because everything in, in my church is allowable. You know, it's like, yes. Like, okay. Hold on. Pastor said, what? We can do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'll never forget the first time I went to a, a, a church, a friend of mine and they were drinking coffee in worship, like in the sanctuary. And I was like, man, in my church, the sanctuary is sacred. You don't bring food. Oh, yeah. Here. We, uh, uh, you know, it's just like you, you value the, the house of God in a Oh, absolutely. Way. Or, even so, I mean, in my church, and I know in many churches, you don't eat before communion that day. That's the first thing that you ingest. 
And that was very strict growing up. My mom would say, oh my gosh, you you had a string cheese on the way here, whatever. So I don't want you to take communion today. Like you haven't prepared yourself. Why was that funny to me that you said string cheese of all the things? <laughs> you're imagining like two little pigtails, like <laughs> and, and, you, and, and what's worse is you're probably sneaking it. Oh no, there was no <laughs> sneaking in my church. Oh, I wish later I, I'm going to send you a picture. I wonder if there's, I'm going to try to find a picture of you because for you, because whatever you're thinking, my church is so beautiful and traditional. I oh. bet it is. I bet it is. I'm talking and, mahogany, gold icons, the whole. And you know, it's whole. funny, your last name, Koval, I never even thought that could have been Russian. I yeah, I think it comes from, it means blacksmith. Uh, someone told, yeah, I didn't even find that out. Someone told my, someone at church told my parents, hey, your last name means blacksmith. <laughs> yes, now, that's why I'm so strong. You I'm know? changing your name now. Richard Blacksmith. <laughs> All right. So from your experience, what advice, and you just kind of alluded to a second ago, eat the elephant one bite at a time. What advice would you give someone who has a desire to read the Bible in a year? I would say know going into it that you are getting a macro understanding of the Bible. You will not have time to pour yourself into all the goodness that it has to offer. Mm. So I would say I enjoyed doing one book a week. I thought one book a week was very doable. And it also makes it so some weeks you have a lot of reading to do. And some weeks you only have a few pages. And, but you have to understand that the Bible was segmented into books for a reason. So if there are fewer pages, it still means that there's meat there to dive into. So it doesn't mean to take a week off. Um, also let your life speak into you. So when we started doing this, so it's a group of about 15 of my closest girlfriends here. When we started this, we got um, the Bible study books by, I'm actually looking at them right now. Um, what is it called? Hold on. It's by Zach. Do you mind if I grab it? Mm -mm, go ahead. Okay. It's looking at me on my shelf. So. Uh, okay. So. So we this, began. You, you followed the structure of this or that Bible's actually segmented? Like, or oh, is, no, no, no. We follow the structure of this. So, okay, these are by Zach Wendell. I don't okay. know if you've ever seen them, mm -hmm. but they essentially give you, um, in the beginning, a synopsis of who wrote it, the audience, the reason, the theme, a key verse, sections, and then it has guiding questions. So, gotcha. we were like, excellent. So, this will be our guide, and then we will read the Bible with it. But of course, nothing goes as planned. Mm -hmm. So, um, while we love Zach's books and we promote Zach, um, to be honest, it felt forced. So his open-ended questions didn't relate to necessarily what was happening in the world around us. We were victims of a tornado. We were starting a pandemic. We were continuing to make career decisions. We were continuing to make life decisions that weren't reflective of his questions at the time. So we were trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Mm. Um, and probably, I want to say even two months into it, we kind of abandoned the process of having an outside guide. Gotcha. And instead we made it, um, we have an incredible leader of our Bible study. Her name is Kristen Hornstein. She's fabulous. And she, she knows us in our hearts. So she will ask more, um, more questions that say, what is calling out to you mm. from this book that you want to share with us today? Yeah. And, and, and in that way, it's an organic discussion mm -hmm. every week instead of us trying to find the answer that Zach or another um, guide writer would want us to, you know, because everyone yeah. has that feeling sometimes where a teacher is asking you a question and you're like, I know you want a specific right. answer, but <laughs> I, I don't gotta know give you what you're looking you for. Right yeah. See, right? my instead of just saying, yeah, what is calling to your heart this week? So yeah, I would say read it one book at a time. Don't don't follow a guide, which is very, I feel like an anti-teacher saying that. <laughs> Go off book. Um, no, but really ask yourself which passage or passages are pouring into you. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself why. And then try to take that train of thought 
and do something with it mm. immediately after. Yeah. So don't stop at the understanding. Don't stop at the comprehension and the analysis. Go to the create. Mm. Like go Look to the. You. So now that I've, I know. High five I'm making, on that one. High five on that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm making my <laughs> my former education teachers proud. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, but honestly, say okay. So this is what this means to me now. This is what it meant contextually mm -hmm. at the time. This is why I might be focused on this. So what can I do tomorrow, tonight, for the next week, the next year um, to live into this? Yeah, yeah. And at our Bible studies, my pastor would do an, an exercise that's very similar to what you just said, but he titled it, what does it say? What does it mean? How does it apply? So just because, uh, what does the verse say? First, just read it. What does it mm -hmm. mean? <clears throat> because you read it and you saw A, B, and C. I read it and saw D, E, and yes. F. And neither one of us is wrong. It's with our yes. experiences with God, God showed us that same verse two different ways. That's the reason why his yes. word is so rich that a person could preach on one verse for a month and give you 30 different sermons yes. about one verse. You know, it's just, a ma it's a magical book. It's, it's ecclesiastical. Yeah. <laughs> See what I, did I feel there? like I've started something. <laughs> See what I did. I wonder there? if I could copyright this. <laughs> Too late. I've already I've like already like if uh, Cardi B can copyright Okra, <laughs> I can copyright this. I have already um, uh started the copywriting process before you said anything. So I'm I'm gonna beat you to it. All right. Um, so what else was it? oh you you sparked something else in me. So another thing that I realized, um, because I am from the East Coast and there is a much smaller youth believer population where I'm from. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it's a, actually, I don't know if I'm misspeaking, to be honest. I, I think outwardly people don't express their religious beliefs as much as they do here. It's not a thing of comfort. Um, mm. Whereas um, in my Bible study right now, at, we have all different levels of um, belief. And we have people that came to it later in life and people, um, who have been raised by pastors. Um, and everyone is open to hearing everyone's story. Yeah. Um, whereas that's not really a, that's not really a conversation, um, that is considered, I don't even know if it would be considered appropriate, but it's definitely taboo in a way. People mm. don't inquire as much to Christianity on the East coast. Um, but wait, I honestly, don't, I don't even remember why I started telling you that it was something you said. Oh, I know. Um, one thing I learned is from all the, the naysayers or people that aren't as comfortable with their faith. When I started reading the Bible, I realized so much negativity that people have to say about the Bible is things taken out of context. Um, and not just quotes. So I think a lot of people know the defensive things are taken out of context, as in you pulled that quote out of a larger quote that if you read the larger quote, you would understand. But what people don't realize is there are two different kinds of context to the Bible. So not only is it dangerously easy to pluck a small piece mm -hmm. and then elaborate on, on that piece to mean something different outside of the paragraph um, or the verse, but more than that, there's the context of the time and the culture that they're living in. Yeah. So if you don't take into account the norms of those specific communities mm -hmm. and that time period, you could read much more malice into the Bible than exists. Mm. And and that's really hard. You sound like a, a seminary student almost. Like you are, man. I mean, it's just <laughs> so awesome because again, and it could be because you love reading. You you probably read like like how a coach watches a game. They can't just enjoy the game. We're dissecting stuff. Yes, we're, yes. We're, we're, we're looking at stuff from eight different angles instead of just entertainment. I, yes. I am analyzing everything. And Complete. So, that's exactly right, what it's like. So you're reading the Bible and because of the way your mind works, literally for literary you know <laughs> you're like seeing stuff that like probably the average person would gloss over and miss you know you yeah. they may miss the personification they may miss all these beautiful things that that verse was developed for 
it just went right over their head. So a person like you could break it down from like, and they're like, oh, wow, I never saw it from that perspective. You know, because like you said, there's a lot of people who they, they struggle with accepting what the Bible says because they'll say there's contradictions. And, and we know from what we believe, God doesn't make a mistake, you know? So it's not a contradiction. It's just that you're speaking to two different audiences of people. You're speaking oh, to different people at different time periods. I mean, this town lives different than this town. So the way things are written, the audience, all that oh, stuff absolutely. plays in, into place. But most laymen, we don't know that. So a person that's a astute, they go to seminary, they can help us understand it. But unfortunately, most of the time, I want to show off my knowledge versus help you love this book that I love. You yes. Know? I want to show you that I know these $5 words, but like my dad yes. tells me, why use a $5 word when a 10 cent word will do, you know? So, you know, you, when people, that's, I think that's one of the gifts that everyone tells me I have is that I can take the concept and explain it in a way that I get it now, you know? Yeah. And uh, it, to me, that's one of the greatest compliments you can get as a teacher is that if you explain it, I get it. But for yeah. some, for well, some you're reason, incredible you're so at analogies. I'm incredible at, at analogies. Yes. I think you create really nice metaphors for things that allow people to access the information through a relatable, more simplistic task. And yeah. my, my Bible study leader, Kristen, is incredible at that as well. I think one of the biggest, um, I think one of the most profound arguments that we had as a group was about free will. Mm. Um, and I, uh, and how can you believe in free will, but also believe in the predestination? Um, and so, if the, the, for example, I very much believe in free will, but I also understand that if what will come to be will come to be under my God. So she held up a, a Nalgene, a water bottle for us. And I remember she turned it to the side and she moved the water all around. And she was saying, this water can move inside this Nalgene, however it wishes. And it feels free to move and it's going to flow how it wants to in each direction, but it is inside of this container mm. and it doesn't know that it has the parameters of this and that it will not go outside of this, but it is able to move within and feel free. And I, st I think about that at least once a week when I think wow. about my free will and my decisions, it reminds me that my decisions are imperative to my life. And mm. I have the responsibility of living a life that's God honoring and people honoring, but also at the same time, I don't need to be crippled with anxiety because God is my analogy. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're, you're, just so you're sealed. You're sealed. You, yes. it's, it's like my dad says it's uh, and my, cause my dad's a retired pastor and he, he preached a sermon that was called managing the middle. All right. You know, the end, if you're in Christ, you know, the end, All right? yeah. the end is you are saved. Salvation is yours. You just got to manage the middle. You know, yes. you got to take care of what's happening between now and then. The best thing to do is to live a life that pleases God, that honors God, yes. because then you avoid a lot of the headache in the middle. Because it's yes. going to be, you know, I, I create, I do a verse of the day every day, a verse of the day video. And today's verse of the day, uh, we were talking about how um, when, when, to, to count it joy when 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 you're persecuted for being a Christian. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's a badge of honor in a sense, because and what I was explaining was that we're going to all suffer in life. But if you're going to suffer, you might as well be suffering because you're doing right and not because of the conse <laughs> consequence of doing wrong. Yes. You know? And so just learning to manage that middle, you know, that that, that yeah. gap there. Yeah, man. Do you have a favorite verse? I know you just got my favorite done verse. Saying. Yes. My favorite verse is John 16, 33. So I'm not going to tell it to you. That gives you something to go back and read. But you know, the way oh, your brain works, oh, I bet you you remember it off the top of your head. <laughs> no. Oh, my gosh. That, no, that, I'm not at that point. That verse is so ecclesiastical. I'm just telling you right now, it's going to blow oh, you up. Hold on. Where's my pen? Got to write this down. Here, I'll make and, you text and, it to me after. I'll, I'll send it to you. But when I read that verse, and I was going to ask you your favorite verse as well, but I, I went with favorite book instead. Uh, but we'll get your favorite verse too. When I read that verse, it was like, the world stopped for a moment for me. Like, you know, like in the movies, the birds stopped chirping. It was like everything stopped when I read it. And it was like, and I was like, Lord, I hear you. Thank you so much for showing me this first. In fact, the, the first book I wrote is called Recap. And I wrote that book as a, um, I, I did a Bible study one, one Wednesday night. And 
when I wrote the book, uh, it was, oh, well, when I did the Bible study, it was a recap of the Bible. So it starts with rebellion, right? Ch chapter one's rebellion. Uh, and then after rebellion, there's repentance, redemption. Every chapter is re something. So it's recap. Oh and my it's re, 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 re. And so I was riding home or riding to work one day and I, I heard this voice in my head that said, you need to turn that Bible study into a book. And I just dismissed it because number one, I don't even read like that. So I, I just, I don't know why that thought's in my head. So I just dismiss it. A couple of days go by and I hear it like really loud again. You've got to turn that Bible study into a book so that more people can have access yeah. to it. And I was like, okay, Lord, if that's you speaking to me, I will honor this, but you got to help me because I don't know how to write. I don't know anything about this stuff. So I sat down and I started writing and um, some days, I mean, I'd write good and maybe a week I had, no no drive some days he'd wake me up at two in the morning i couldn't sleep anymore i had to go downstairs and when i i promise you when i would write on nights like that i always go man this is probably ain't gonna make no sense in the morning those were some of the best <laughs> chapters it was really? like because it was like almost like it wasn't me it was just pouring in me it was just coming yes. out coming out and um so uh when i finished writing recap recap it, it it blesses me because when people read it they send me messages and say stuff like chapter two was so strong, man, I had to read it like six times. And I was like, to me, that yeah. that if if I sold a million copies, I'd be grateful because then I wouldn't have to come back to work. <laughs> but if I sold <laughs> one copy and gave a million away and it blessed three people, I feel like my job was not exactly, involved, you know, so that was my, my drive. My drive was never to become wealthy. My drive was to share what God had placed within me for my little small circle of people and honor his 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 uh, his charge in my life yeah. turn that into a book that's going to bless other people yeah so yeah and the recompense of, fact, of other I'm, people's experiences i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna have to get you a copy of it since you love to read i, I was just about to say and i heard that every guest of the show gets a free copy no, signed no, copy no there, that no, no, is personalized not signed. That is only vips let me check to see if no. you made the vip list Almost. You're almost there. You're almost on the VIP. <laughs> You're on the wait list. You're three down. <laughs> three is actually my favorite number. So you, since you pulled that number in, you just popped up to the, to the uh, VIP list. You are in the house now. You're in the house. So now as a teacher, aren't you glad that a lot of the biblical names you read have fizzled out? Aren't you glad that you don't have to call attendance and say those names? Oh my gosh. Wait, I have a story about this. <laughs> I have a story about this. <laughs> My first month moving to the South, I was calling names on a charter school bus. And I was like, Eric, <laughs> Rebecca, Malachi. Malachi. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone laughed. I said, hey, Malachi. is Malachi on the bus? <laughs> and they said, it's Malachi. Someone get that woman a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> what grade was this this was uh i was middle school in west nashville oh wow. uh, so this was like seventh and eighth grade i think malachi that is hilarious someone get that woman a bible malachi. And that woman and, did get a bible and, look, and she learned how to say malachi <laughs> and malachi is one of the easy ones <laughs> just imagine those, oh, those hard you ones. have no idea one of my favorite stories is um Nebuchadnezzar mm. and I can like for the life of me I always want to tell the story because I love that story and I'm also reading um Obama's book right now mm. and he talks about how the sermon that he heard on his inauguration day was the one where Nebuchadnezzar sends the the three men into the furnace did wow. you know that no. and that's the one that he was that's the one that his pastor spoke to him on that day saying, you're going into the furnace right now. You need to have faith and you will come out. So, wow. but I, I, all, I know. Amazing. And so it's like, I gave me goosebumps. I know it's incredible that I wish I had his book with me right now to read the passage, but I always want to tell it. And I'm always like, so there was this guy named like a bed a guy named like, and that's like the easy ways to pronounce it. They're, they're the real names before they changed. It was harder than those. You know, Delta Shazer and oh, I, yes. Shazer and, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. So I, I thank God all the time that when I call attendance, I don't have to call all those. But, you know, it's funny. You you I don't know how many Jesus you've had in your class <laughs> or angels. I have angel Jesus. Most of the time when you have an angel, they're always naughty. Right. Yeah. Always naughty. But 
One thing I can say I'm grateful, I've never had a Satan. <laughs> you ever had a Satan in your class? I mean, not like a one that acted like, but an actual Satan. <laughs> never, right? No. No. I am, I'm trying you, to think. you would have to hate your child, I think. I do name love Nevea. I love Nevea. I yeah. think we should all start making names things backwards. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because the reason I said it, I, I used to uh, coach football with uh, with this uh, older gentleman and his family took care of invalid people. That was their job. And so he was getting ready to go out of town to Alabama. And so they had a substitute stay at their home to take care of the people in their home. And uh, they had a, a big German shepherd, beautiful dog. I mean, trained like to perfection. He jumped over the fence and got out. So the lady calls him and she says, hey, your dog just got out. He said, it's OK. He's he's expertly trained. All you got to do is stand on the uh, edge of the um, the uh, the porch and just say, Satan, come to me. Satan, come to me. <laughs> the dog's name was Satan. That lady said, <laughs> that lady said, I quit. <laughs> I am not beckoning Satan into my life. <laughs> it's the opposite of the not today, Satan. Right. <laughs> not today, not tomorrow, not any. I'm not beckoning him into my life. I'm sorry. So she was like, I'm done. I got to go. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. That's probably been 20 years from 20 years ago. And I still remember that. It's hilarious. They get the dog back. I'm sure they did, but that lady wasn't going to call him. No, nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Satan, Satan was going to have to fight his That's way back. That's some bad home. juju. <laughs> right. Right. Now, do you remember a time when you were reading that, because I just told you about my experience with John 16, 33. Do you remember a time where you were reading where it's just like God just paused you for a moment and say, Paul, stop right there and feel what I just said? I mean, a hundred times over, but... Psalms was overwhelmingly emotional for me mm. just in, in the poetry of it. Yeah. I would say, um, also, uh, the hardest, honestly, usually, okay, this is another good piece of advice I have for someone reading all the way through. If there's a book that's hard for you to swallow, it's because you need to read it again. Uh, there's something that's well, not sitting right say that your one soul. more time we gotta hear that <laughs> one more time <laughs> for the people in the back <laughs> mm, in the way back <laughs> if there's a book that doesn't sit right with your soul mm. it's because you need to read it again and read that. it again and figure out which part of it your life is in contest with and why mm. um and for me that was the book of job and um i could not move past a good man being stripped of everything. And then even though, even though in the final verses, it says that God returned to him what he had, um, what was it? Threefold? Sevenfold. Sevenfold. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course. Seven. Um, I Stripping a family and stripping lives, you can't restore that. And mm. I think it's also because I was in Bible study uh, with a, a few close girlfriends who have lost um, siblings and parents and like just a lot of loss in their life. Mm. And I lost, um, one of my best friends when I was a freshman in college. And when I think about the loss of a life, I didn't like the fact that it was so succinctly put like, and then God restored it mm. because you don't just restore a life that you took away. Yeah. It, it, you can give a new life, but it, it's, it's shifting a heart. It's not filling the hole that you've created. Mm. And I just kept reading it. And I, I honestly, I need to read it again because it still doesn't sit quite right. Yeah. And see what I would say for, for if I could offer any, I guess, I don't know if you call it advice, but any comfort in that is that some things we will never grasp or totally yeah. understand. But what I would, what I get out of Job is that God has to be first place in your life, no matter what because he gives yeah. and he takes away everything we have in this life. It's to be honest, it's like, because, you know, we learned there's no marriage in heaven, right? There's yeah. no giving in marriage. So as much as I love my wife, when we get to heaven, we're not married anymore, you know, you know, so it's like, uh, I, I need to enjoy what I have with you yeah. now because it's all fleeting anyway. It's all, you know, mm -hmm. of course, Again, this is a person that hasn't lost very much in their life. So it's a lot easier said than done. But when you look at, I love the fact that 
He lost all of his children. He lost all of this wealth. His friends come to sit with him. But the one person that was allowed to remain, his wife, right? And she becomes a voice for the enemy later. Why don't you curse God yes. and die? See, it, it, it just shows you the chess yes. plays that the Satan and, and the Lord were playing. The, the Lord yes. said, have you considered my servant Job? He's such a great man. Yes. And the devil says that's only because you take care of him so well. Yes. I promise you, if you didn't take care of him like that, he would curse you too. And God said, well, try it, but you cannot touch him. And so he does all these things, does all these things, and Job stays strong. And then he touches Job's body. And now, of course, we know when our bodies get weak, it starts affecting our minds, but mm -hmm. he still stayed strong. But then he could have taken his wife, too. But the, the devil kept the wife because I'm going to plant a seed in her later. <laughs> Serious. I mean, yeah. think about that. Yeah. It's a no, subtle. No, I know. Because I thought you were going to make a joke. The devil no. kept the wife because he knew that was torture in itself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you think about it. She came on the scene and her her only statement that's recorded is, yeah. why don't you curse God and die? And just to think in that moment, he's really, really weak. His friends are there. They're kind of judgmental. You know, I mean, this kind of stuff don't happen to just everybody, Job. You had to have done something wrong. Job is like, look, I can't figure it out. I wish I had never been born. You know, it, it's such a rich book, but like, I definitely get what you're saying. And I love that statement. In fact, I think that's going to be a t-shirt we're going to make with your your quote. We're going to quote it and put Rachel Koval. You know, if there's <laughs> a book in the Bible that doesn't sit well with you, you need to reread it. If there's something you're fighting against, it's because it's something that you need to surrender your heart in that situation. It's I something think that's personal a, with you. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. And it usually signals something that you haven't done the work to forgive yourself and God for yet. Mm, man, that's deep. <laughs> that's deep. Man, I'm loving it. I'm, all right, so you mentioned about rereading. So I was going to ask you, did you find yourself rereading a lot of sections? I know you said it's, it's going to be more of a macro view because you're trying to get through it. But did you find yourself going back to reread a lot of stuff? I did, but only, I only had so much time because I was moving through it very quickly. But when I felt uneasy in my life, I read a lot of Psalms. Mm. And like, because it, Psalms are mantras. They're, they're poems and they're mantras. And you can find one that, that you need. Mm -hmm. If you feel like, I'm needing a prayer right now, but I'm not in a headspace where I can, where I feel like I would write a prayer to do my emotions justice. There's one in there. Um, what, what the one on my, one of my darkest days last year, it was the Psalm about God being your shelter mm. where it repeats multiple times over that, um, he's got you, he's your shelter. He is your rock. Um, and that's one that I repeated and reread a lot um, mm -hmm. in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. It gave you all the yeah, strength you needed. That's going to bug me. I could find it if I had time to rifle through. I'll find it later. Is it the one with you're my refuge and my strength? Yes. What is that one? I don't know. We can find it real quick, though. My refuge. And rock. And is it Psalms 46? Be... Psalms 46, maybe? I mean, you know, because I'm sure they says that one quite a bit because I see it in Psalms 91 as well. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Oh, no, it's Psalm 18. Can Psalm I read 18. it? Yeah, go ahead. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Mm. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. Mm. My cry came before him into his ears. What translation are you reading? That's a really good question. Oh, the New International Version. NIV, yeah, that's what yeah. I normally read too. It goes, I mean, it goes on for a long way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, but that's so, beautiful. But yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, just listening to you read it, I gained strength. You know, I gained a little, yeah. 
It's like, you know what? Things are going to be tough and and all of us have to endure something. You know, the key is to understand that if we're enduring it and God is with us, we're going to get through this. You know, it's just we got to manage the middle. Got to manage the middle. And it's the, the imagery. The imagery yes. in Psalms is incredible. I love just the, the repetition of coils. That is the perfect term. Like when things coil around us and res- and we feel this like invisible restriction of our lives. Mm. And he will loose those. Look at you. Straight English teacher up in the house. I, <laughs> All right. So I know we got an important uh, meeting coming up in about eight minutes. So what do you think you, that meeting is going to tell us? And I'm, I'm praying it tells us. What we, hot want take. We, want you, we want to hear it first. When are we going back, coach? Oh, Lord, I just pray. It, I pray we wait until fourth quarter. I'll be honest. Let's just yeah, give it more time. A clean, yes. And just come back. If, if, if the numbers are right, fourth quarter, we, we stumble back in and we fight, mm-hmm. fight out the rest of the year. But to come back in with three weeks left and yes, with the possibility of going back home in two more weeks, it's just, you know, just, just wait, just wait. But you know, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm, I'm just a regular old teacher. I know loves, we're small fries. Loves the cheering. As they say, the that's above my pay grade. <laughs> Get this woman a Bible. <laughs> Malachi. Malachi. Malachi on the bus. <laughs> That's going to be the next t-shirt. I'm going to latch you on the bus. All right. So I got two more questions for you, then we'll wrap it up for today. Do you think that reading the entire Bible in this fashion has really changed you in any way? Uh, Because you kind of had a foundation already, but tell me a little bit about that. I think it, it harkens back to what I told you before, where if you're reading in this fashion, you're not going to be the page brown of the world that that has the time and nor the amazing wisdom that she has to break down all the passages so god and the world around you is going to call to you what you're supposed to be focusing in on that week mm. i cannot wait to reread and look at my annotations and think why the heck did i think that was so important and it has three asterisks next to it because <laughs> the, you know what i mean and say wow that verse meant so much to me in 2020 mm. um for x y and z reason and now you know that one doesn't call to me this one does yeah um so i think yeah i think it's about like i said before not forcing an understanding Mm-hmm. but allowing the understanding to fit with where you are. Yeah. And the blessing is this, if you don't understand, I mean, God promises that he'll bring things to our mm-hmm. remembrance, right? The key is to just keep pouring it in you because yes. even though you don't get it right now, it's building upon something, right? Yes. I mean, as an English teacher, you know, you got verbs, nouns, pronouns, blah, blah, blah. First, you got to learn what a noun is so we can start putting, you know, subject, predicate, all that yes. stuff, right? I'm trying to show you how much I know, you know. <laughs> Y'all be like, he's a PE he, teacher. He, he don't know predicate. nothing. Right. <laughs> I'm going to give you a badge on Schoology when we yeah, hang you, up. I, I need that badge, you know. But to, to see the progression and to see how you didn't realize I was I was karate kidding you. I was I was Mr. miyagi you. You know, you were you thought you were painting the fence. And so when you read Genesis, Mm -hmm. you thought all I'm doing is just painting a stupid fence. Mm -hmm. But then five years from now, everything you learned in Genesis, you're going to use those same principles in your life to block off the enemy's attacks. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's the Bible is so, so rich. It's just you got to give God the time to work with you in Mm -hmm. your in the areas of your lack, you know, because it is hard to digest some of those words and especially if it's King James and you're trying to say these names. And at first you think the names are insignificant. Who cares who blah, blah, blah. But when you start seeing connections later that that's so-and-so's grandfather, that's so-and-so's mm-hmm. grandmother. Exactly. All of a sudden it's like, Oh, that's like a plot twist in a book. That's yeah, right. I know. it is. Hold on. So Boaz and Ruth and hold on. So yeah. Ruth is Jesus's <laughs> great, great grandma. Wait, what? And that's then tight. and sometimes there are cliffhangers where you're like, the line of David is still alive. <laughs> they told me in the last three. <laughs> like, even though you knew it's it's like a Disney movie, you know the they're gonna end up together, you know the half they have after, but you're still along the way, mm, like still hanging forward. in there. Yep. I mean, it's just so it's so much fun. That's the way I look at it. It's yes. everything you can think of that you want in your reading. It's there. There's murder. There's mystery. There's crime. There's uh, there's romance. You know, I mean, you think about even with with Joseph and his wives, you know, Rachel and mm-hmm. Leah and, and they even the ladies were like, OK, look, 
Uh, if you if you uh, let me have David or let me have Joseph tonight, I'll give you uh, I don't know if, it, if if my pastor was teaching us about it, but, you know, because Rachel couldn't get pregnant. So yes. there was a, a an herb called mandrakes and Leo which is was in Harry Potter. Oh, see, I didn't know which that. is a screaming baby in Harry Potter, <laughs> which is an allusion to the Bible. Oh, wow. I'm so serious. See, it's, it's crazy. It's right? a screaming potted baby in Harry Potter. Mm. And I was trying to explain to someone the other day. I was like, no, that comes from something. <laughs> so the it's mandrakes all... is what it was like a fertility thing. Yeah. Right? So if she takes the mandrake, it may help her to get pregnant. And you just see sisters who are married to the same guy who have to come up. Look, I want him to spend time with me tonight, but she's cockeyed <laughs> and he ain't into the cockeyed sister. You know, it's like, you, <laughs> you can't tell me that the Bible's not just awesome. You know, <laughs> I know. So I know so I'm I, with you. I am. I am super grateful for your time. I always finish my podcast with special guests with this last question. Oh. And it is this, who is that one person? Because we love to give a shout out. Who's the one person in your life that lived so much like Christ before you that it encouraged you to really give God your heart? It's cliche, but my mom, a hundred percent. Not cliche. My mother, Amy Koval, is a fantastic human. She she does not speak about others unless it is kind. Mm. She truly bites her tongue. And she modeled that for me my entire life growing up. Um, she was the head of physical therapy at, uh, at a hospital. And she gave that up to be a physical therapist in the school system that I grew mm. up in so that she could be a great um, mother and wife and also care for so many more children that had less financial means. And then she retired last year and she couldn't not give back to the community. So she became a councilwoman in her town wow. at about 70 years old. Yeah. That is awesome. That and is I awesome. just see her serving others until she croaks. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> I didn't... <laughs> right. Until the Lord calls her home. <laughs> I know until, and then, you know, but just think the way you just described your mother, it just I could see the gifts that God must have placed in her, the gift of compassion, you know, because oh, everybody yeah. doesn't have that. You know, I, I have a gift of teaching, but I have no compassion. It's like, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Like, how are you going to get a person to really want to hear what you have to share if you don't feel their pain that they need to know what you're sharing? Yeah. And so your mom is is giving. She's loving. And because of that, maybe she doesn't have to quote scripture. The love she shows is yeah. all the Bible someone's going to read. Right. Oh, they, absolutely. they feel God's love because of your mom. So oh. sh shout out. You said, was it Mary Koval? Amy Koval. Amy. But there's one more thing. I'm, I'm really resonating with it now. Um, one other thing she does that I think is so incredible is she doesn't look away from the pain in the world. Mm -hmm. So I think the reason why she was able to work with children that had severe physical and mental disabilities most of her life. And in general, when things are hard, she doesn't look away from it. She doesn't avoid it. She looks right at it and tries to do something about it. Yeah. And I always admired that. I remember going with her as a kid on take your daughter to work day and I would cry even as a kid, seeing the pain in other kids. And she would say, you know, I understand. And that is, you know, an initial response to this. And then you have to say, so what do we do? So yeah. how can we help them? We can't, yeah. we're, we're not here to avoid the pain of others. Wow. So that maybe that's why you're such a decent human being, huh? <laughs> a little chip off the old block did you there. Just, did you just call me decent? Decent. Yeah, decent. I couldn't give you a, a bigger compliment because I know where that will lead. Then you will hit me harder with your insults. You know my head's already. Oh, get out of town. You were probably one of the most humble people I know. You just can't <laughs> wait to put me back down. Yeah, that's true. But it has been an honor hanging with you for this hour. We, I'm going to let you get ready to get on that other call so you can see what our fate is. And um, again, I will definitely share this information with you in the coming days as I edit everything so you can share it out with your people. But it's been great hanging with you. I know. Thank you, Coach. Give Columbus a huge hug. I'm getting ready to go do it right now. Okay. All right. Bye-bye.